Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe to the channel for regular content on ancient architecture as well as all of the latest news from the world of archaeology. Standing inside the enclosure of the Great Sphinx of Egypt is truly a spectacular experience and you can't really get a true feel of the grandeur of this monument until you're stood before it. Visiting ancient sites around the world is amazing, but my first impressions of the pyramids and the Sphinx really did surprise me. Maybe it's because of all the beautiful wide-angle photos and video footage in documentaries, but the Great Pyramid felt smaller than what I imagined. But on the other hand, the Sphinx felt larger and even more impressive. And yes, of course, we've all seen specific measurements and diagrams, but you can't get a true feel of scale until you're stood on the Giza Plateau. Anyway, everything was impressive, but I think I was most impressed by the Sphinx. Because of all the controversy surrounding it over the past three decades or so, when you're inside the Sphinx enclosure, you can't help but pay close attention to the erosional patterns as many continue to debate the age of the monument. And I don't mean the age of the form we see it in today, that being the lion-like body and pharaonic head, but the age of the quarried enclosure, the age of the hollow that was man-made, leaving a large chunk of limestone bedrock in the middle. When we're talking about the origins of the Sphinx, that's really what we're talking about, when the enclosure was first created. And although geology can be a useful indicator, I think what we've learned in the past three decades is that nothing geological in this enclosure is cast iron proof for a pre-4th dynasty origin. The geology is complex, and there has never been just one weathering and erosional process at play. We have wind erosion, we have groundwater wicking and haloclasty, we have rainfall and also rainwater runoff from the plateau. At times, the Sphinx enclosure could well have been submerged by a high Nile inundation, and then we also have the drastic temperature changes as night turns into day, and this does affect erosion. All of these factors and also many more do need to be considered, because on some level, they've all played a part in the deterioration of the limestone. Weathering has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, and erosion for thousands. And so, the geological history of the Sphinx enclosure is, well, complicated to say the least. For example, let's look at the western wall of the enclosure. This is subject to wind erosion. It's been subject to rainfall erosion and also rainwater runoff. It's been subject to haloclasty in the upward wicking of groundwater. It faces the rising sun in the east and is subject to huge temperature changes as day turns into night. Maybe this wall is showing a more dominant erosional process, which you could argue is rainwater runoff from the plateau. But still, there are so many factors to consider. And we also need a full understanding of the climate, groundwater level and rainfall throughout history. Different independent geologists have analysed the Sphinx enclosure and many of them disagree with each other. Because, as I said, it's complicated. Some geologists say the Sphinx enclosure is perfectly in keeping with an Old Kingdom origin some, like Colin Reader, think it could be late pre-dynastic or early dynastic, and others, like Robert Schock, say it's many thousands of years older than the conventional date. But there is one observation that often goes unmentioned, and it could be the smoking gun with regards to our understanding of the age of the Sphinx enclosure, and that's what I want to discuss for the rest of this video. It involves a mix of geological and archaeological observations, and it does seem to imply the Sphinx enclosure, with the lump of limestone bedrock in the middle, whatever its original form, does in fact predate the 4th dynasty. 
and it's all thanks to the work of geologist and author Colin Reader. Before I go further, I want to point you to Colin's website, giftofgeology.co.uk, because as well as being a fantastic resource of information, he's also just published some very rare and important research. On his homepage, go to the menu and then navigate to Sakara Geophysical Survey Project, and there you will find the work of the late Ian Matheson. For 20 years, Matheson led an unprecedented and remarkably thorough investigation of an area of the Saqqara necropolis, marked here in red. At the time, it was a pioneering use of geophysical techniques, and he often achieved spectacular results. As part of the project, annual reports detailing the work and the findings had to be written, and then submitted to the Supreme Council of Antiquities. But since Ian's passing, no further fieldwork has taken place, but the project director has given Colin Reader permission to publish all 18 annual reports on his website, and they're free for everyone to download. I've only just started going through them, but there is a lot of information I've never come across before. I've left a link to Reader's website in the description below, so please do check out what is an important resource in the study of ancient Egypt. Now back to the Sphinx enclosure, and an acute observation made by Reader a number of years ago, when he wrote his paper titled Khufu Nu the Sphinx. Now, most will agree the Sphinx temple is contemporaneous with the Sphinx enclosure. The limestone blocks were quarried from the enclosure and used to build the temple. This is because we see the exact same rock types, and well, logistically it makes sense. But regarding the Sphinx temple, experts agree there are at least two phases in the construction, with the second phase allowing for the extension of the temple's north and south walls. The northern extension required fresh cutting of the bedrock, extending the Sphinx enclosure's northern wall to the east. You can see it best when looking from above. When I visited the Sphinx back in 2023, knowing Colin Reader's observations in advance, the first thing I looked at was the second phase quarried wall to the north of the temple. It is well preserved but is notably far less eroded than the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. In fact, if we look at the northern enclosure wall from west to east, there is a stark change in preservation. The western part is well eroded, and we should note that this is the harder Member 1 limestone. It's harder than the Member 2 rock that makes up the southern and western walls of the Sphinx enclosure. But as we can see, the eastern end of the enclosure wall, the second phase cutting to the north of the Sphinx Temple, is far less eroded. And why is this? You could say, well, the Sphinx Enclosure and the Sphinx Temple Phase 1 are both 4th Dynasty, may be made by Khufu or Khafre, and the Phase 2 came sometime later, maybe in the First Intermediate Period or even the Middle Kingdom. But no. The consensus amongst Egyptologists is that the Phase 2 extension was done in the 4th dynasty. According to Colin Reader, the quarrying was dated by Lena and Hoas to the 4th dynasty, and this is based on archaeological finds, including hammerstones and pottery, and these were found in a number of removal channels above the quarried face. These channels are part of the quarrying process and were excavated in order to isolate blocks of limestone for use as masonry. It's believed the Phase 1 Sphinx Temple was first constructed and then the north and south colonnades were added in a second construction phase, but the experts say this all happened in the 4th dynasty. But to Colin Reader, when looking at the northern Sphinx enclosure wall, the western end is far too degraded compared to the eastern end. He believes the geology does show evidence the two phases of work were undertaken in very different conditions of weathering and erosion, and were likely separated by a significant period of time. 
This picture shows the end of the phase 2 quarrying work and it still looks neat and sharp and that's compared to what it's next to, the older wall of the phase 1 Sphinx enclosure. Just go to airpano.com, link below, a truly fascinating resource for researching Giza and browse the northern wall of the Sphinx enclosure. The Phase 2 work does look much younger than the Phase 1, but we are told and are meant to believe that both were cut in the 4th dynasty. Somehow, I just don't think so. The evidence therefore points to a pre-4th dynasty origin for the Sphinx enclosure and also the first phase of the Sphinx temple. The second phase of work was in the 4th dynasty and this could have been when the form of the Sphinx we know and love took shape. So, that is a key piece of geological evidence combined with archaeological finds which shows the Sphinx enclosure looks to have been first quarried sometime before the 4th dynasty. Maybe the enormous chunk of limestone bedrock left in the middle was just what they call a quarry block. Or maybe it was always a monument, later reshaped into the Sphinx by either Khufu or Khafre. And, in truth, this shouldn't be any kind of enormous shock because there is plenty of evidence for pre-dynastic and early dynastic activity at Giza. We have pre-dynastic Madi pottery found across the Giza Plateau, there are early dynastic tombs located to the south, and also early dynastic artefacts from the Chroma Dump. To make way for the bold pyramid project, Khufu, Khafre and then Menkore could have cleared any older structures, maybe a settlement from the Giza Plateau but then keeping and incorporating the Sphinx enclosure and temple into the new funerary plan. I'm yet to see a good counter-argument for this evidence that was put forward by Rida, so I wanted to put it out there once again, to spread the message, because observations like this should be more widely known about. Many of us continue to seek the true origins of the world's most famous ancient monument and well, in my opinion, no stone should be left unturned. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.